Good morning, everybody. This is Sangeeta Saxena, editor, Aviation and Defense Universe, getting you live from Delhi. And we are on a rundown to the Indian Army Day, which is going to happen on the 15th of January. And all eyes today, not at Delhi, but at all parts of the country. And this is the first time you have Indian Army Day celebrated at various places. It's going to be actually fun. And let's see how things come up. And to discuss one facet of the Indian Army, which is very strong, very, very strong, which is Indian Army's Siachen operations, Siachen activity. We are at Siachen. My palter is at Siachen. This is what you keep hearing in, uh, and the pride which comes with saying this is what we've been hearing all our lives. And today we have with us to discuss this somebody who's not only had the distinction of landing for the first time on Siachen, but also has the distinction of being the DG Infantry of the Indian Army. I think one of the most coveted positions anybody would buy for. And here we have with us General Sanjay Kulkarni. Uh, good morning, sir. Welcome to ADU's chat room. Wonderful to have you here, sir. Ma'am, good morning. Jai Hind. Wonderful to have you. As always, a pleasure interacting with you, ma'am. And so today is a topic which is a topic after, I think, the heart of the whole nation, the Siachen Glacier, sir. And Indian Army, of course, all salutes to them for being there on those tough terrains. So there's a, you know, we were having this uh, little uh, Q&A conversation, uh, which we uh, distributed to a lot of people to understand uh, what is Siachen, how, what do the people understand by it? And we were surprised that they all said, oh, we know it's a part of the war between India and Pakistan. But they didn't know what it was, where it was, how it was, what are things, why it became a bone of contention. So, so the best thing to begin with would be that we would request you to make it an open book for our viewers. With the five W's and one H of Siachen Glacier, sir. And we would really like to understand the, our first thing from you, which is what is Siachen Glacier, sir? Uh, thank you. At the very outset, uh, let me tell you, uh, the word Siachen, you know, it is supposedly a, a rose. And Chen, a, a lot of people say, means artificial. But it, that Siachen means a rose garden. That's what it really means. It's a glacier in the Karakaram, uh, 76 kilometers long, about 2 to 5 kilometers wide. And, uh, well, the second longest glacier and one of the coldest places outside the polar region. Now, when you talk about Siachen, the first thing that strikes your mind is a glacier uh, height. It starts from, say, about uh, 12,000 feet and carries on up to Indra Kohl, which is a little over 20,000 feet. So that's the length, but over 76 kilometer long, the way it goes about. From the snout flows the Nubra River. So you have the Nubra River that flows from the snout of the glacier. And you have, it is bounded on to the eastern side by the Karakoram Ranges and onto the western side by the Saltoro ranges. Now, it's very, very distinct, very clear. The word Karakaram actually means black mountains. And you can see that when you're standing on the glacier, that on to your uh, uh, eastern side, you will find that the mountains are black in color. And onto the western side, the Saltoro ranges, are they're a little brown in color. And between the two are these glaciers. Now, this glacier is actu actually speaking, the ranges around it are mountainous paradise. They have lovely Saltoro Kangri. Now, Kangri means the peak. It's the highest peak. Saltoro Kangri, Sia Kangri. And then you have like places called Bella Fondla, Siala, Jongla. La means the pass. And Kangri means the peak. So that's the way it is. Now, having seen that, we found that in the Karachi Agreement, what was decided was that since it was not possible for people to go there and demarcate and delineate the boundaries over there, so... And a place till where it could be done was a point called NJ9842. So NJ9842 till where the boundary was demarcated and delineated. And both India and Pakistan during the Karachi Agreement knew it. And that is where emanates the ceasefire line to what now we call the line of actual control. Then the ceasefire line. Because after 1971 war, the connotation changed from ceasefire line. It became the line of actual control, uh, the, uh, the line of control, not the line of actual control, the line of control, the LOC, because the LAC is referred to with China and the LOC is referred to with Pakistan is concerned. So I'm now referring to the ceasefire line that existed after the Karachi agreement. So this is where it was. 
However, over a period of time, one realized it, that the Pakistanis were doing a cartographic aggression because when I say cartographic, the maps indicated point NJ9842, then northwards. Then northwards, invariably in mountains, it goes along the watershed principle. It's internationally accepted watershed principle. That means you should have followed the Soltoro ridgeline and going and extending up to round, say, K2. K2 is the world's second highest peak, the highest peak being Mount Everest. However, what the Pakistanis conveniently did, and in, I would say, may or may not be in collaboration or inadvertently by the Americans, they joined point NJ9842 with Karakaram Pass. So between the Karakaram Pass, which extended further to the east, and instead of going up, then northwards towards K2 along the Soltoro Ridge Line. Now, this particular area between the K2 peak and the Karakaram Pass is the Siachen Glacier. Plus, adjoining it is yet another valley called the Shaksgam Valley. Now, that is where it is all about. The Shaksgam Valley was ceded by Pakistan to China and gifted to them in 1963. And a valley which is approximately about 5,000 odd square kilometers from where from the pass over there called the Kunjara Pass in the Shaksgam Valley runs the Karakoram Highway. Now, the Karakoram Highway is now more associated and linked with China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So now we see there's a CPEC, the Karakoram Highway, which extends and joins. And from there, from the Xinjiang province of China, through the Kunjara Pass, through the park-occupied Kashmir, the Gilgit Baltistan, it extends towards Gwada and down to the Indian Ocean. So now we understand as to why both these countries are equally interested in this particular area. And adjoining it is the Siachen Glacier. Now that's where the whole story is. And the Pakistanis, you would sponsor expeditions to Siachen Glacier and the peaks around through generally the pass called Bella Fondula, and that is where the foreigners would come. How is it that we got to know about all of this? It's when Kal N. Kumar, called, popularly called the Bull Kumar, very famous mountaineer uh, from the Kumar regiment, and uh, he was called Bull because of his stocky nature. He is unfortunately no more uh, with us. We passed away. But a wonderful man, uh, excellent mountaineer. It is in his... The, uh, one of these uh, rafting expeditions that he had done with the German uh, mountaineer adventurer, he, he had again come and he was having, uh, you know, interacting with him. And he told him that he is again coming back and he intends going to Siachen Glacier and uh, climb some uh, peaks around the Apsara ranges and things of those. So Colonel and Kumar, out of sheer curiosity, asked him, Mr. Can you show me the map as to where are you going? So he showed this, these are the peaks that he's climbing, this is what it is. And to his horror, he found that all of it is in the Indian territory and that his German friend seems to be going to Pakistan and it is Pakistan which would then be sponsoring his expedition towards these people. He was quite shocked. Having learned that, he requested him that could he pass on the map to him. He said he had only two. He said, no, no, he would give him 500 rupees, but please give the map to me. So 500 rupees was a deal between Colonel and Kumar and his German mountaineer friend. He dealt with, he gave him the map. The first thing that he did, he took that map and he came to the army headquarters. And he told uh, the chief then was General Raina, again from the same regiment. And subsequently, General Malotra was the chief. And General Chibba was the, the, the those days used to be called DMO. He was a major, major general, as the not as the director general of military operations, but the DMO. So that is where it was. And he went to the chief and he said, show the map. He said, this is what the Pakistanis are doing, sponsoring. This is our area. It seems all uh, quite fishy, the whole thing. He said, okay, you just go to the DMO. So he went to General Chibba. General Chibba said, told him, what is it? He referred him to another brigadier and told him, okay, look, Colonel and Kumar has come with something. Just have a look, see what is he talking about. And sure enough, there was a alarm bell that, yes, the Pakistanis were sponsoring expedition to Siachen Glacier on to some of the peaks which are all otherwise belong to us because the delineation, demarcation up to NJ984 then northward bent along the Soltoro Ridge Line and not where the Pakistanis were now doing a cartographic aggression. Having said that, then he wanted permission that he must be allowed to go and explore these areas because if left, left unexplored and if they don't get to know, he 
you know, Pakistan slowly and suddenly would start claiming this area. It is in that context that the first time the word Siachen Glacier actually, you know, people got to know what is it about, what, what are the uh, Pakistanis doing over there, which foreign expeditions are being sponsored. A lot of basically primarily Europeans, Japanese, you know, Americans, these were Germans, these are the people who the Pakistanis sponsored and earned a lot of money from uh, allowing these uh, mountaineers to go and climb the peaks over there. This was now around 1976-77 when all this is happening around. And I incidentally happened to be doing a course called the High Altitude, uh, in the High Altitude Warfare School called the HAWS at Wilma. We would be doing courses like mountaineering, basic courses, advanced courses, skiing, basic and advanced and things of those kinds. So I'd gone down to the, to the basic course in uh, 1978. That's the year that I was there. And I heard for the first time that some seniors were there, otherwise to be doing the mountain warfare advanced course, had also come there, but they were planning to go to Siachen Glacier. Now, one hadn't heard. As part of it, we were also going to a Ladakh, and we were to climb a peak called Stok Kangri, which is the highest peak in Le. So, and the rest of this course, the seniors who were, had already done the basic and were being accompanied with uh, Colonel N. Kumar, were heading for Siachen Glacier. Now, that is where for the first time they went and saw what it is all about. And then at that point of time, the Pakistanis ensured that they, that somehow they had got a wind that there is some uh, patrolling or uh, mountaineering being done by the Indians in Siachen Glacier. So they flew their aircraft and they flew their fighter aircrafts over there to uh, put a scare into them to say that, oh, look, this belongs to us and how come you all are over here? So that is it. Now, subsequently, again, uh, Colonel and Kumar went with another expedition. He did skiing over there. And now we have what is popularly called the Kumar base. Now, this Kumar base is popular today. And now when we have this lady officer, Captain Chohan of the engineer, who is now being, you know, who is there for, to yes. stay there for 90 days on top of the glacier like all other male officers do, which itself in itself is a very big achievement by uh, this lady officer. Fantastic. Now that she is planning to go and stay on uh, top of uh, Kuma for 90 days for the engineering task that she's been given, wonderful. I think uh, all of it. So well, this one thing which I wanted to understand here, I wanted, wanted to just discuss at this point, is that you know the, when uh, I mean I was uh, I'm a veteran's wife and uh, have gone till the base. Now I there was a very big uh, you know misnomer and a sort of a you know belief. That if a woman comes here, there's heavy firing between the two countries. And now you have a woman posted there, sir. So do we expect firings as per the belief every day now? <laughs> well, fortunately, at least on Siachen, the ceasefire still holds between <laughs> India and Pakistan for oh, almost, uh, you can safely say, about 20 years now. At least the ceasefire <laughs> is holding on Siachen yes. because Pakistan, no, should they open fire, they had it. So they would rather hold the ceasefire. So what suits them, they do uh, follow it. But all said and not, you know, it is not so much by firing that most people uh, become casualties over there. It is that weather. The weather is extremely, extremely bad. Unbelievable. I, I'll tell you, the temperatures can go as low as minus 60 degrees. Some people say minus 70. But extremely. And variation. Supposing during night, it's minus 20 at a point of time. During day, it could go plus 10. No, you can see the variation that the body has to withstand during the short time. And again, in between also during the day, it gets foggy, misty, you know, it suddenly it starts snowing. Blizzardous weather, the winds will blow and over 100 kilometers an hour. That makes it more difficult for anybody to survive over there. So this kind of a wind and that kind of, you know, snowfall, unpredictable weather, crevices, you, avalanches that follow, you, the kind of uh, uneasiness that sets in because you have headache. You can't touch anything with a bare hand. The uh, difficult to breathe, difficult to eat, difficult to sleep, difficult to touch anything. You know, you don't feel good. Memory loss, uh, various kind of diseases. You could have snow blindness. You could just develop a hapo that's having lungs in the water. Anything and everything that can develop there. Suddenly you find. So even if you have lost about a thousand or people on top of Siachen Glacier till date, ever since since 1984. I would safely say about 85% people would have become casualties primarily due to weather. 
the weather condition. So it's that bad. So it is weather more than the enemy. So the enemy is okay. We have to be handled and tackled. But weather is something which you have to really uh, acclimatize with, adapt with. And to say that so and so is huge, hefty, toughy chap, he'll manage and handle it. It isn't like that. It, each body, everyone's body de depends on how he or she adjusts and adapts to that kind of weather and that kind of height. All of it. It's very, it, so it is that, uh, that, those are the major challenges that you face on top of Siachen Glacier. So coming back to what was happening then, and having done the Kalan Kumar story that I was telling you and how it all happened, then we decided that uh, as part of the uh, long range patrolling there in 1982, we went as part of it as called Ibex Hunt and then saw what was happening over there. And then since uh, I had, uh, was aware of what was happening in 78, I just about heard it, I hadn't seen it. But then, as luck would have it, as part of four Kumar that I belong to, uh, we were then sent, I was part of the uh, advance party and the battalion was to move from Dehradun to a place called Batalik and from Batalik subsequently to a place called Turto. Now, since we were to go to Turto and finally be there, where generally the Ladakh scout people were the ones who were deployed over there for many years, ever since 1947 rather. They were the ones who were handling and manning that area. So we were told that we would be going to Turto. So 1982, when this uh, patrolling was going on, I had an opportunity to, to see what the Achin Glacier is all about by flying, not by walking. In 1983, uh, uh, I was supposed to be the patrol 2IC to an officer, a Major Thapa, who had led the Ibex hunt in 1982. But as luck would have it, he sprained his ankle just on the way uh, before during the training. And I was told that you will now lead the patrol in 1983. So as part of the polar bear exercise, uh, patrolling for long range for about three months on top of the glacier, I familiarized myself with what it is. I saw what Bella Fonda is, what are these various camps. To most people, when you climb Mount Everest, you have three camps. Camp 1, Camp 2, Camp 3, and you assault Mount Everest. Whereas on Siachen Glacier, you have Camp 1, Camp 2, Camp 3, Camp 4, Camp 5, Camp 6, and then you go towards the other. So it's... And every camp means one night halt. You can't probably want to do it more. Because as they say, don't be a gamma in the land of Lama. Anybody can attempt to do even cross two camps and do it and probably fall sick. And it will be of no use. Because anybody who falls sick over there and if he has to be evacuated on, along with your, you would read not less than 16 men to evacuate one chap. Because he would be on the stretcher. And four chaps carrying him on the stretcher, they would get tired within five to ten minutes. Then you have another set of boys carrying him. Then yet another set of boys. So you require too many people to just evacuate an individual until unless the helicopters are made available. Helicopters can only fly if the weather is suitable. If the weather is bad, you can't see anything. It's foggy, misty, poor visibility, total whiteout conditions. Even the helicopters won't come. And poor uh, this chap, whoever has fallen sick, he has to be evacuated because one way of uh, surviving is to lose height. So even if you are hallucinating or you are not feeling well, best is to start losing height. As soon as you start losing height, your body starts feeling a little better. So all these problematic conditions, so all that we were going through is 1983. Having done that, in 1983 itself, the Pakistanis decided to come once we had deinducted. So once we deinducted sometime in the month of September or October, we found that the Pakistanis attempted to the SSG, that their special services group, to come on top of the glacier and decide to occupy as we were living there for the last three months. They thought they would be able to stay there also. And then probably next year when India comes, they would already be sitting on there and obviously then things would be different. But they could not survive. So the core commander of the Pakistan army decided that it's better to pull them back because otherwise all of them would die. And they were not equipped, neither were they fit enough to survive on top of the glacier. So they pulled back. Now, this has a mention by Musharraf in his book called The Line of Fire. Now, Musharraf at that point of time was a lieutenant colonel and posted in the MO branch of the park. Now, since he was a lieutenant colonel, awaiting his promotion to become a brigadier. So he and he himself is a part of the SSG, who subsequently had, when he was promoted, went on near the glacier and launched numerous number of attacks, all failed. All failed as he as the commander of those attacking troops. And it is that which led to his revenge being taken when he launched Kargil operation. 
he launched Kargil when he became the chief of the army staff. He thought that since he could, act as a brigadier, launching so many attacks on Siachen, he failed. He might realize take revenge by doing what he did in Kargil. So that is where the, the Kargil backdrop comes in. So in 84, when the, they were decided that we would go and occupy, we told that 13th April 1984 would be the date chosen to uh, go and occupy the glacier. Now, most people at that time said, why 13th April 84, 13th is an unlucky day, why can I choose 14th or go on the 12th? And the commander then began at Channa. He was firm. He said, look, 13th April is a Baisakhi day. And it's the most auspicious New Year day for all of us in India. And we want to launch. And so it is celebrated in Pakistan because Pakistani troops are all Punjabi troops. And Baisakhi is celebrated by them also. So we will launch it on the 13th. He said, well, fine enough. The commander's decision was final. Everybody top and down agreed. And by now, the director of military operations, General Chibba, had become the army commander. And now he was Lieutenant General M.L. Chibba, Northern Army commander. We had General Hoon, who was the core commander. We had General Sharma, who was the divisional commander. And Brigadier Channa, who was the brigade commander. As a, then called the sector commander, because it used to be a sector, not a brigade at that point of time. So this was the setup over there. And I was told that, look, you will now lead it in 1984. And you would take one platoon of yours and occupy Belapondla. And the Ladakhis will occupy with one platoon, Siala. And since it was a platoon, they said, no, it would be a company commander also would be a part. So Major Sandhu, BRC, Pokemon became the company commander uh, with us at Belapondla, with one platoon over there. And Major Bahugana, along with his platoon, became the, uh, uh, the platoon which would occupy Siala. So Camp 1, Camp 2 and Camp 3 were to be occupied by us, by Fokuma. And then we had a platoon which was behind Bela Fondla. And similarly, Camp 4, 5, 6 to be occupied by Ladakhis and they would occupy Siala. So that is how the whole thing was. And we decided to launch on the 13th of April. For this, it was very important that did we had the clothing. Because all these years, we were going there sometime around July, August, which is reasonably comfortable month. But to go now in April, it will be virtually suicidal, is what General Hoon thought as a war commander, because he himself was an instructor in halls. So he knew as a mountaineer that it would be impossible for anybody to survive. So he said, Let, uh, if that be so, we will get imported down clothing, down meant feathers, which were in generally uh, lacks of bird feathers, which can give you warmth. And uh, if you wore those jackets and trousers and, and all of it, you can sustain temperatures going down to minus 30 degrees also. And that is the kind of equipment which generally mountaineers use it for climbing Mount Everest. So that equipment is what would be required to for the troops if they were to now go along the glacier. General Hoon decided to go shopping for buying that equipment abroad. And when he went abroad, he was told that all of it has been bought by Pakistani army. He was shocked. He said, what? There is nothing available. He said, nothing is available in Europe yet. And all of it has been bought by Pakistan. So that was the first indication that came that if so many sets of these clothing have been picked up by Pakistan, even before December, that is an indication that they are on to doing something. And that something meant Siachen Glacier and nowhere else. So with that as a backdrop, then he said, wow, he decided that nothing doing, we have to get some sets. So he managed to get a certain number of sets, which landed, as you'll be surprised, on the 12th of April in the evening at the base camp of Siachen Glacier. And 13th April 1984, we have to launch. And on the 12th of April in the evening, the, the, uh, the high altitude clothing in which arrives at the base camp. With that as uh, this thing, we were said that it would be done. Now, one day prior to the launching, as I was taken on a helicopter reconnaissance, and I was told that, look, uh, just see what we had seen in 83, if all of it is in place, intact, any changes, whatever it is. So we flew around, and I found everything fine. The weather was perfect, very, very, you know, fantastic blue sky, lovely glaciers, all of it. My memories came back of 83 when I saw all of it. The aim was that we are not to fly on the glacier 
and we are not to open the radio set lest the pakistanis get to know because obviously if you fly on the helicopter by helicopter on the glacier they would all get to know that there is something going on and if pilots are also obviously talking one another on the radio set they'll pick it up so we were told no radio set and no flying and so one day that uh, one recce and it was 30th of april 84 530 in the morning we were told come on all air force got the helicopters and all of us two in each because there were small helicopters pilot the co-pilot and two passengers behind in the first one i was there along with my radio operator and uh, we were told that you will land just short of bella fonda and then you walk up to bella fonda and occupy it and it's perfectly fine so while, while we were flying on top of the glacier the pilot told me uh, i'm sorry i can't uh, land and you'll have to jump i said uh, jump uh, that's not a major problem but uh, what if i sink then you'll have another problem of extricating me and therefore i said uh, i just thought i had that ataka bori uh, with me and i said i'll throw this ataka bori down and once if it doesn't sink i said it's perfectly fine then you know that the surface is hard and it can always uh, jump on the glacier so the pilot said perfectly fine so if i threw that open the uh, the door of the helicopter and uh, threw the ataka bori down and we found that it hadn't sunk it was on top of the surface i said perfectly fine you can hover i'll jump now so the pilot hovered and i jumped from the helicopter and of course i also did not sink i gave him a thumbs up and i said perfectly fine no problem you can uh, go along with it and that is how uh, the radio operator who was sitting next to me obviously had the uh, you know the radio set on his lap he couldn't jump now that the helicopter could land he got out and the other helicopter which was towing us and observing what is going on he finally he saw that this helicopter had landed it took off and then he landed and slowly and steadily the entire lot landed on bella fonda you won't believe it was around uh, uh, 11:30 or so the same set of helicopters were to go and uh, drop the platoon at siala the weather turned absolutely bad unbelievable it, it you, you know something you cannot imagine i can't i can't believe it i said it was such a perfect morning how come the weather has turned so bad blizzard as well visibility virtual zero ah by the time we could even pitch a small uh, pop tent it was getting extremely extremely difficult within no time the we had this radio operator of mine said i i'm finding absolutely i am unable to breathe i'm breathless and he was to be evacuated so the first casualty was within the first hour itself that was this uh, boy mandal who was the radio operator he was sent back and such a terrible weather that the platoon which was to go to siala that had to be postponed and for the next 3 days the weather was extremely extremely bad and during this period we lost another boy now this boy who had accompanied me in 83 uh, i remember his name last night ramesh thing who subsequently got kirti chakra posthumously now this boy was there and my god i said what happened how come uh, ramesh uh, passed away they said froth and obviously must have uh, you know died because of sapo now that is where the situation was so bad and we were just shot up bella for luck we decided along with uh, kan sandhu i told him i said it's good that you open up the radio set do much that you been told to observe radio silence we have to inform them that we've lost the boy and uh, that now something would have to be done to evacuate him to the base camp so we opened the radio set while the radio set was been open and all this was happening and his uh, ramesh uh, was to be evacuated to the base camp i was walking up to bella fonda while i was walking up to bella fonda sure enough Lo and behold, I see a Pakistani helicopter right on top of Bella Fonda. I could have a eye contact with the pilot over there because I was now over eighteen thousand feet and standing and watching it. He saw me. I saw. He take took a U turn and he took off. And that was the time they would have realized. Well, much that they wanted to preempt us, Indian Army had preempted the Pakistanis on top of Siachen Glacier. Now, how all of it got to be known is again. to the book written by musharraf in his line of fire and he said that the indian army preempted us on siachen glacier indicating very clearly that pak army was very very keen to occupy it and that 
they wanted to, but their co-commander probably told them that they would need to occupy it after the 1st of May, and so that at least the SSG, which they were trying to use for occupation, which had to pull back because of the bad weather, would probably be able to succeed in the month of May. But we preempted them by occupying the Siachen Glacier on the 13th of April, 1984. And that is how the, and since then, till date, we are on occupying the entire Siachen Glacier. Park is nowhere near the Siachen Glacier. The Pakistani army has launched numerous number of attacks. All of them have failed. We've defeated them all over because in mountains, it's very natural. Anybody who's occupying heights, it's very difficult to dislodge him. And the kind of experience that each one of us gets, like you rightly said, everybody takes pride in the army today. If he has served on top of Siachen Glacier, he probably feels, wow, I've ultimately done what I joined the army for. And that is where we look at it, that everyone in the army today, for him, Siachen Glacier means the ultimate. Uh, uh, and he feels that, yes, he's done it because he's been on top of the glacier. For us, for initial, uh, I could say the pioneers, the credit goes entirely to my troops. You know, a lot of people keep asking me, no, no, you would. I said, I did nothing. Anybody in my place could have done it better or the same. No forward. It's the troops that matter. Troops are fantastic, unbelievable, unmatchable. And they, they, they motivate you to put in your best. And that is how, till date, we are on top of Siachen Glacier. Yeah. Wonderful, sir. I think that was a beautiful story told so nicely. And I just love the narrative, sir. Absolutely great. So, you know, it's Siachen is a topic which can be discussed and discussed to the core. And I think what we've done today is that we've got the uh, subject to a platform where the common man will be able to understand what it is. And uh, there's lots more to talk, sir. And definitely, when we come to our next uh, sessions with you, we are going to talk about the current situation. How do we manage it? How do, how do the two, how does our army manage? And how do they sitting behind, you know, want always to be a part of anything which is going on here? And it will be wonderful to have a session again with you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful narrative. And we just loved it. I'm sure the audience will really love it. And, you know, nothing better than understanding the enigma called Siachen Glacier on the Army Day. Army, it's a hats off and a greatest salute to all the men who've been there. And uh, with this, I think we can put an end to our discussion today. Thank you so much, sir. Jai Hind. Thank you. Jai Hind, ma'am. Jai Hind. <laughs>